Hello, everybody, and welcome to Find My Past from Home. It is Friday, and that means new records on Find My Past. And of course, we are always, always, always happy to be here to celebrate the start of the weekend with you and to jumpstart our genealogy and our research over the course of the next couple of days. Um, it is so good to be here. I was on holiday last week. Um, it went well, mostly. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm very good. I'm very happy to be back. Um, uh, we had a great time, actually, did a little road trip across uh, New Mexico and went to Carlsbad Caverns National Park. If you have not been there or if you've ever wanted to go to a cave, I highly recommend it. It was amazing. I hope you all get the chance to experience a cave at some point in your life because fabulous, fabulous experience. Um, all right. So it's Friday and that means more records on Find My Past. Uh, but before we dive into that, of course, as usual, let us know who you are and where you are and where you're from and what's happening in your world. Um, there is a lot going on in, in these times and days, um, but hopefully everybody is making time for family history. Um, so that we have something uh, to keep us occupied and to leave behind. Um, so lots of you um, chiming in. So thanks, everybody, for being with us. We love our community, and it's so wonderful to have you all um, with us every week. Joan is in Woodenville. I think she means Woodenville, Washington, which would be pretty exciting. It's very good. Um, and she says, this is a nice comment, actually. Uh, let's share this. Hi, all from a very beautiful morning in Woodenville. Looking forward to this session. Thanks for all your research and hard work to make our family history come alive. That's perfect, Joan. That's the perfect way to set the tone for, for today's session. Um, so let us know where you're at. Daphne's in a muggy summer set. Um, it is Friday the 13th. We're going to ignore all the superstitions for today. Um, <laughs> uh, and and uh, we'll just leave it at that. We'll acknowledge it and, and move on, right? Victoria, Andy, Rosie, William, it's cloudy in Cumbria. Um, Andrew's in Lancashire. Roz is in Massachusetts. Thanks again for joining us, Roz. A heat wave. Yeah, the, U.S. is having some real dramatic weather um, this weekend. Hope everybody stays okay. Um, Beth is in North Wales. Karen's in Harrogate. Uh, let's see. Um, Sue is in Guildford in Surrey. Um, oh, Joan confirms. Yes, Woodenville must be Woodenville, Washington. That's very fun and exciting. Miko is, of course, with us. So good to see you, Miko. I haven't had a chance to say hi yet this morning, so hi. Uh, Angela's in France. Thank you, Angela, for being with us. Steve from Ontario, our good friend Steve from the Ontario Genealogical Society. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, Jane is in Southport. Ah, so many of you, and I love that it's such an international community. It's so, so good. And William, thanks for sharing the link um, to the caves with boats. I will look at that. I, you know, um, a couple years ago, we took our daughter on a cave tour at one of the other national parks and she just loved it. So we've just been going after caves ever since. It's been fun uh, for the whole family. Karen's in London, um, hot central New Jersey. Hello, Ruth. I hope you stay okay and comfortable. Everybody should be safe um, in this extreme heat. Adrian from Huntington Beach. Um, Susan, also in Ontario. Thank you, Susan, for joining us from Thunder Bay. All right, lots of people. Thank you very much um, for joining. We have a packed hour uh, to get through, and I think it's going to be a really, really good conversation. I think it's going to be a fun one. Um, question of the week. Uh, oh, before I get to that, actually, let me acknowledge Niall was in the comments with us today. Um, so everybody say hello to Niall uh, and wish him well. Um, he, he has been working really hard this week. Um, lots going on at Find My Past and lots of really exciting things, but Niall is really at the crux of it all. Um, he's a master of keeping all of that organized. Um, okay, and Donna's from Scotland. Thank you, Donna. All right, a, a packed week, or a packed hour rather. Um, so the question of the week, uh, if you didn't already see it posted, um, we will post it again. What have you learned about your ancestors that has changed the way you live today? or giving you new perspective on how you live your life. Um, and I had some interesting thoughts about this topic. Actually, Miko and I were chatting about this yesterday. Um, and um, I, I really thought about this one a lot and realized how much actually in the last 24 hours or so uh, through discussion and kind of some introspective time that um, it really has affected me in a lot of 
lot of different ways, right? Emotionally, but also physically and, and mentally for sure. Um, so with that in mind, um, please post um, <laughs> please post your answers to the question of the week. Remember to mark it with a Q um, or the QOTW acronym uh, so that we can find your responses better. Um, and Miko, thanks for the compliment on place names, but I am not going to fall into those those traps that you posted. Um, and uh, Niall says, remember to share the video and tag your friends. We want the Find My Past community to keep growing. And indeed we do. So let's keep um, diving in. And for that matter, share this with your family history societies, right? This is great content for family history societies to engage their members with. Um, so feel free to share the video on your family history society Facebook page or uh, on your YouTube channel or link to the series. We would love to connect with your organization. Um, okay, so let's talk about questions of the or records this week. Um, yeah, it's been a long week uh, and I'm not talking well. I'll fix it, I promise. Okay, a couple of um, a couple of essential records this week. Um, so let's start with the vital records first. We had baptisms and burials um, updated collections, um, both from Essex, the Waltham Forest Family History Society worked with us on that. Um, so we have a 13,000 more baptisms from Essex and 30,000, almost 31,000 more burials um, uh, records on the site. So those are uh, additional materials added to existing collections. So if you're looking in Essex um, for your family, make sure to take us another look at those record sets and check them out for any new entries. We had um, additional materials come in as well for our British Army Service Records collection. Uh, we had some new materials from the Chelsea Royal Hospital. The discharge documents of pensioners got updated a little bit. Um, so some new military records in there. Um, and then one other that I thought was actually kind of neat. Um, I've never seen these before. So these were new to me. Um, this is from the British Army as well. The Royal Engineers. Um, and the collection ranges from 1900 to 1949, but it is largely the World War II period, so 1939 to 1945. So this is actually tracer cards, um, and they plot the movements of the individual um, within and between the regiments. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, we did the essentially the first half of the alphabet, surnames A through H. This um, update finishes the alphabet. So this is um, phase two of that project. Um, and um, I, I took a quick look at these and I want to share them with you because they're kind of cool. Um, I Again, I've never seen these before. There are similar records in the U.S. that I'm familiar with that kind of look like this, but the idea of the tracer card uh, was, was relatively new to me. So let me pop that up on the screen really quick. And you can see the kind of details um, that are included in these cards. So this is just a random example. It's a man named George Brown, and you see all of these entries. Um, and he actually has, I think, two or three of these. But you've got his his um, registration office, his core trade. He's a clerk. Um, all the dates that are appropriate. Um, you've got some stamps and some notations, which um, um, which uh, carry weight, right? For all of our for our research, we want to make sure that we follow up on each one of those particular hints. Um, and possibilities, and this is live, guys. So always risky doing a live demo. But um, and then uh, his promotions through through him, his unit um, and the various units that he moves to. And then finally his discharge date. So these are these are pretty cool cards, right? So um, a really really interesting set to to play around with and look through. If you have World War II um, individuals, you might want to take a look at that uh, from the Royal Engineers. Now. There are a couple other record sets on Find My Past that you might also want to examine in partnership with this, right? So if you find your ancestor, your family member in one of these cards, you probably also want to look at the Royal Engineers journals, um, which cover the World War II period, which are available on Find My Past for 1939 to 1945. Uh, and I'll show you an example of that in just a second. And then there's also the Royal Engineers casualty cards of other ranks. Um, so there are two other collections that kind of go hand in hand with this Royal Engineers tracer card set um, that can really help you develop a really thorough, full story uh, of your ancestors. So let me... Um, actually put up an example of the do, 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 gotta find it of the journals here we go 
And hopefully you guys can see this okay. It's a little small. Let me zoom in a little bit. Um, this one, uh, the reason I like this actually is because it's this whole story about he, um, this individual, G. Brown, Lieutenant G. Brown. Um, and I just, again, just kind of a random example that I just um, uh, happened upon. But I love this opening paragraph, right? It says, it's hard to believe that it was entirely unconnected with the incident of the green paint. I mean, that absolutely makes me want to read more because what's the incident with the green paint? That sounds very interesting. So I'm going to have to read that. Um, <laughs> you know, you see down here, there's a, a an, an indent for 10 tons of green paint. This is going to be quite a story to read through. This is the kind of stuff that you can find when you start connecting these collections, right? Um, in most cases, when we publish something on Find My Pass, it's not just kind of this random one-off thing. It's it's something that you can connect from collection to collection to collection and move through the story of your ancestors. So don't look at your family history and, and these new record sets in isolation. Absolutely use the tools that are available on the site, right? There's always suggested records down off of to the side of the screen on, on the right-hand side of the Find My Past search screen. Um, take advantage of those, right? Because those are, are absolute, you know, uh, uh, provide the opportunity for further research and for kind of connect, connecting the dots. It's great to have the dates of his movement through his service and his promotions and when he got discharged and all that essential kind of information. But filling the stories in with materials like this is what it's all about, right? This is where the fun comes in. Uh, and I love the, the green paint. I'm probably going to continue to use that as an example because <laughs> that it's just a great it's, it's just a great um great segue, right? I'm looking forward to finding this G Brown in the tracer cards to see um what his his whole story was. It'll be good. All right, lots of people coming in with the question of the week. Thank you very much. Um, we're gonna we're gonna get to those in just a minute. Keep them coming. Uh, love to read those. Also, want to make sure everybody is aware. Uh, we talked about this um, last week and last week and and this week for sure. But we have just announced recently free newspapers on Find My Best um, and the British Newspaper Archive. And we're super, super excited to be um, partnering with the British Library. They are just a really prestigious institution and something, you know, that's a partnership that we really, really are very proud of at Find My Past. There are now over a million pages free to search and view, and there's more to come. This is just the first part of that project, um, of that that agreement. Uh, and we're going to share the link um, in the comments so that you can see all the different types of projects that are available and some of the examples of titles that are available. And we know that um, not every newspaper is, is in that collection, um, but I'm sure that there's going to be something of interest for a vast majority of you. There are some really, really interesting titles in there. Uh, so please explore those those historical newspapers. They are free. Um, and we would encourage you to continue to go out and find your stories and make sure that you're investigating everything about your, your ancestor, not just their birth, marriage, and death, but really get into their lives. And that's a great way to do it. You know, newspapers are, are absolutely essential. Okay. So um, one other thing I wanted to start doing, I'm going to start doing, um, we always ask you, and I certainly always ask, what are you working on this week? Um, you know, what have you been doing? What's exciting in your family history? What, what have you popped on that, on your research that has really made you happy and excited over the course of the last week? How much time have you spent? What have you found, right? Or, or not found, right? In some cases, negative ev evidence is, is really, um, <laughs> it's really just as important, right? Um, so it, I decided to share um, what I've been working on. Um, so I found a couple of things this week that actually um, I've had for a while <laughs> in my files, um, but I've never had the chance to actually chase down. So these are the things that I'm going to be doing over the course of the weekend. So I have two. I found a newspaper article, which, yeah, I printed a really long time ago. I don't even remember when I found this. Um, actually, I didn't make I didn't make a note of when I made the discovery, which is you know not a proper citation. My my bad. Uh, oh, actually, it printed on the date 2019. I've had these. So there's a newspaper article from the Star, and it's um, from 1895, May 30th, 1895, and it talks about an individual, um, Charles H. Bott who was a member of the Odd Fellows. And um, in the article, they talk about um, how he was being 
um, potentially investigated for embezzlement of the Odd Fellows organization that he was a member of. Um, so kind of this upstanding citizen, and suddenly dis they discover that maybe he's not quite as upstanding as they thought. So it's a few paragraphs. Um, from there, I'm going to so this weekend, my plan, I'm going to take all the details I can out of this article. I've already found his, I think this is his 1881, 1881 census. Um, and I'm going to do a little bit of research on this guy and see what else I can dig up about this embezzlement story. He's not related to me. I just find fraternal societies really, really interesting. And this is, um, if I can track this down. This will be the second case of embezzlement uh, from a organization like this that I have been able to research. The first one was in Florida. Um, and thankfully, their organizational minute meeting, meeting minutes are all available online. So I was able to track the story really pretty easily. Um, this one, I think, will be a little bit tougher. I don't know that much about Odd Fellows records from England. Uh, so I'm going to challenge myself this weekend and see if I can dig up uh, Bot's story here and um, and figure out what he was up to. Um, oh, and there's an advertisement here for California wines I just noticed. So that's, that's pretty funny. Okay, um, the second thing I am going to work on this weekend is um, this article that I pulled shamelessly a really long time ago. Um, this is um, an article that was written um, in 2017. It was published in Genealogy in 2017, and it was written by the fabulous Tahisha McCabe, um, who is a great friend of Find My Past. Um, and if you um, know of her work at all, you know that she is specifically interested in um, American immigrants into Scotland and that, that kind of story of American-Scottish relationship. Um, and this article talks about Americans and return migrants in the 1881 Scottish census. Um, and I'm going to ask Niall to post the link. If anybody's interested, um, you can find this online. It's free to download. I've read it. I've read it a couple times, but I'm going to read it again. And I'm going to really thoroughly look at all of her citations and her reference materials because I'm thinking and I'm getting ready for the release of the 1921 census. Uh, and I think my suspicion is that there will be um, return migrants in 1921 as well in big numbers. Um, so I'm going to read this to understand how she processed through the 1881 Scottish census in order to better prepare myself for that release. Uh, so I'm doing a little bit of 1921 homework, and I hope that you are also doing your 1921 homework and getting ready for that. It's very exciting. So the, that's what I'm working on this weekend. Um, and so my discoveries this week were actually going through my old files and pulling a couple things that I've always wanted to kind of go back to and never have. So um, I'm definitely going to do it now. Um, okay, so um, a couple of fun comments. Um, We've got one from Angela saying that made me smile. I have a gun maker immigrated to Canada, was a grandmaster mason, but I believe drank all his wealth away. Well, yeah. Um, you know, most fr fraternal societies were originally drinking clubs. So, I mean, you know, something there. Um, then we've got one who says an embezzlement from the AOH in the family. Now, that would be an interesting story I would like to hear. Uh, if you ever share to or should should choose to share it, uh, that would be a fun one um, for me to read through. I love this stuff. I think it's fascinating. Um, okay. William discovered this week that, oh, this is a big comment. Let me get a little taller. <laughs> Mom's side of the family are very confusing when it comes to research because of name changes. Plus, they happen to all live in the same place as others with the same name. One new DNA test is challenging to match to as it's another common name to research in the family move between Ireland and Cornwall. So not always in one place. William, it sounds like you have a challenge on your hands for sure. Um, but I think it would be a fun one. It sounds like a good challenge. Um, okay, let's see. So. I don't see a lot of other responses. Oh, I did want to share this one about the green paint. This was a funny one. Um, where did it go? We talked about the green paint a few minutes ago. Janine, they needed 10 tons of green paint to make try to make England look like Ireland. <laughs> That's funny. Um, <laughs> um, maybe it's just Friday and I'm tired, but yeah, that's that's pretty funny. Okay. Uh, 
Oh, no, this is good. Okay. Donna says, I found a distant relative who sold fake shares in gold mines in Colorado. That was actually really, really common. Um, uh, the gold rush, all of them, there were more than one in the United States and, and across the world, right? Um, all these mineral rushes um, was... Uh, you know, that was big business and people ran into these areas really not knowing anything about prospecting. And the thing is, when you're talking about the gold rush, you're actually talking about land and property, right? You're talking about land deeds and they didn't necessarily know what they were getting into. Uh, so Donna, that's a great story. Um, another one I'd love to read more if you ever wanted to share it with us or uh, write a blog post or something and share it with us. So, um, all right, cool. Let's get on to the question of the week. And I'm going to scroll all the way back up to, through the comments to get myself ready for this conversation. Now, the question of the week is, you know, a, a big one, kind of a big um, thought provoking question. What have you learned about your ancestors that has changed the way you live today or given you new perspective on how you live your life? And I think there's a, so many ways to answer this question. Um, and to address this question, um, again, for me, very thought provoking, very kind of, you know, very much an, uh, going down memory lane kind of situation. You know, I've been working on my research since I was about 10. So that's just slightly over 20 years. Uh, it's a little bit more than that, but <laughs> um, I don't want to age myself too much. No, really, um, uh, about 30 years now um, um, with any kind of serious intent. And uh, I think about my life before genealogy. And I actually don't remember much of it, right? Because I was so young when I started. So I think about all the ways that, that family history has impacted me. And I just, you know, I, I don't know who I would be without family history because I've been doing it for so long. But let's see what a few of you guys had to say about that. Um, so Beth said, if it wasn't for various paths crossing, I wouldn't exist. Gosh, yeah, that's true, Beth. I am living within easy 15 minute drive from where some of my ancestors came from. You know, um, that's, so all this thought over the, all this consideration over the last 24 hours about this question and, and that hadn't um, popped into my brain yet, but you're absolutely right. Um, and I think many of us could, could describe that in a very real way, right? I have, um, two ancestors, one on my maternal side, one on my paternal side. They both fought in the American civil war on different sides. And at one point at the Bana second battle of Manassas, their units were lined up against each other and they could have very easily been, um, you know, facing off to each other, like literally face to face standing um, against each other. And you look at the battle maps and they couldn't be any closer. They both survived the war. They both went on to, you know, marry and have children and here I am. Right. Um, so yeah, that's a very poignant thought. Beth, that, you know, if it weren't for, for these things happening kind of almost randomly in the world, right, we wouldn't ha be where we are, we wouldn't exist. Um, so that's a, that's a big way to start our question of the week, but it's a really, really good one. Um, William, um, always a, a great contributor to our community. It doesn't matter what we go through in the 21st century. Our relatives of 20th century and earlier lived much tougher lives than we did in more ways than one. Multiple wars, no electricity, no technology. Generally, their lives were much harder. And I, I would agree with that. And I think a lot of people made similar comments, right? Um, um, there, I saw a couple others about you know, uh, uh, running water and farming and that kind of thing. Um, it's, it's very much true, right? Technology has advanced so much and, and not just this type of technology and doing live streams, but when I mean, you think about the day that uh, pencils became kind of, you know, available for the masses, that was big technology at the time. Um, and of course the industrial revolution and all of that. And in the American West, right? Barbed wire was a huge advancement uh, and a game, absolute game changer for the way ranchers and farmers worked in the American West. So, you know, there's all sorts of different aspects of, of technology and invention and creation through the history of human, the human uh, society that, that we could look at and, and go back and say, what was it like the day before that was made available at their local store, right? That's, um, that's always an interesting perspective for me. Um, do, 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 oh, this is a very timely and, and good perspective. Seeing how many of my relatives had children who died from diseases like measles, whooping cough, and TB or her 
who were permanently disabled by diseases like polio has made me very pro-vaccine. Maybe if we, if more people research their own family history, we'd be moving forward right now. Yeah. Um, I, I think there's opinions out there for everybody and I won't get into that too much, but, um, yeah, but I think, um, you know, science has given us a lot of, a lot of advantages. Um, my dad had a cousin who had polio and he was in a polio lung most of his life. Uh, and he remembers him and talks about visiting him and taking him out um, to see things in the neighborhood and, and what that life was really like for him. Uh, and it's quite striking, right, to think about live, trying to live life that way. Um, gosh, so many great responses to this. What it um, I wish I could sit down with all of you in a room and actually just talk face to face. This would be um, probably, we'd probably all end up in tears, I think. I found members of my birth family all over the world. And since finding them in the English family has brought me to the mindset that my physical size is genetic and I feel so much better about myself. Wow. Um, that's a perspective I hadn't had before that, that family history can be um, confidence building. And that's, wow, that's powerful too. Ah, this is really cool stuff, you guys. This is really great. I'm going to keep scrolling. Uh, let's see. Do, do, do. Okay. Um, there's so many good ones. Um, do, do, do. This one's even got a hashtag. Karen tells us, I've made contact with a DNA cousin, and he sent me a pic with three of my maternal grandma's siblings in it. I was so excited. I immediately rang my mom to tell her it's the little things. And I think that's actually in response to my what did we find this week. But it's appropriate to um, the conversation of the week, too, right? The question of the week saying it is the little things, right? Sometimes it's just those little moments in family history that bring us the most joy and the most uh, most um, kind of glee of discovery, right? Um, so really, really good. Um, Angela uh, says, I don't think it has changed my life. My mind has always been open and unprejudiced, but I suppose now more so as I see all sides from a canal boat family who would have been unspeakable in the past to well-to-do gun manufacturers, a grandmother who was a dancer to possible Irish rebels down near Vinegar Hill, Wexford. Now I'm going to have to Google Vinegar Hill, Wexford. Um, <laughs> I do think it's... Uh, it, it's exploring those stories that allows many of us to kind of broaden our perspective a bit. Um, and I don't know that I would say that any of us feels like we're, you know, prejudiced in any way. Um, I would agree with that in the sense that we always feel like we're open-minded, but sharing these stories and being really honest about where we come from and who we are, that makes us even more so, right? Um, my own personal experience with that is, is researching my, my ancestors who were enslavers. Um, it's it's not an easy thing to do. And it's something I only pick up kind of at intervals, right? Because it's it's very emotionally taxing to think about that. Um, and to think about that, that's part of American culture and history that I come from. But it is part of that reckoning of family history. Um, so a couple of you are saying, you don't think it's changed the way it's made you live. And I, you know, when I was thinking about this over the last 24 hours or so, one of the things that I, um, that occurred to me was, was my grandmother. Um, my grandmother got me started in, in family history all those years ago. And one of the things that I, um, didn't really recognize about her when she was alive, but certainly we saw it when, after she passed and we cleaned out the house. Um, my grandmother lived through the depression and, um, she saved everything. And I kind of knew that about her, but I didn't really know it, know it. You know what I mean? Like when we cleaned out the house, we saw it physically with our own eyes. Every rubber band, um, you know, over here, I don't know about uh, in the UK, but over here, when you buy celery at the grocery store, it comes with a rubber band around it. And she kept every single one of those. Um, every plastic bag she ever put her hands on, um, glass jars, jelly jars, jam jars, those kinds of things. Um, you know, mayonnaise comes in a glass jar, or used to sometimes pickle relish, those kind of stuff. I, they all come in glass and she would save all of those and reuse them. Um, and that, seeing that, I didn't realize until just the last, you know, a couple of days that I actually do all those things too. Um, I save all the rubber bands and I have a giant collection of, of 
plastic bags and grocery bags that I reuse for a variety of purposes. And I have a shelf full of jelly jars that I've washed out. And, you know, my husband and my daughter kind of chuckle at it a little bit, but I know uh, retrospectively that it comes from my grandma and her habits that I picked up on. Um, and, and it's very, so it's a very tangible reminder now for me that my family history, my family have had, you know, this kind of immediate impact and effect on how I live my life, right? We reuse glass and plastic bottles. We use fabric napkins instead of paper. Um, we air dry our laundry whenever we can, instead of using the dryer, um, we save all of our rubber pants, right? The, all those things that grandma used to do that I have, uh, have maintained those habits. And some of that has developed over the years and kind of come out over time. But every time I kind of think about it and I, I look around my, you know, just my household, my housekeeping type habits, I realize more and more how heavily influenced they were by my grandmother. Um, so, it's those things that I'm thinking about that how, how has family history impacted me in, in a very tangible and physical way? I think that one of the reasons I have those habits is because I spent so much time at grandma's house learning about our family history with her and, and hearing those oral, oral stories with her that I picked up on those where my sisters and my brother did not necessarily. I know they have some of those habits, but um, but certainly not all of them. And I know that because I asked them last night um, <laughs> um, about this, right? You know, do, do you guys all do this? And I got a lot of mixed responses, whereas I, you know, I definitely um, ingested, I, I don't know if that's the right word. I, I kept those habits from grandma, but I spent the most time with grandma. So it it kind of makes a lot of sense, right? Um, it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's quite striking, actually, that, you know, that our family history has had that kind of impact on just how I live my life. And I hope that, of course, my daughter will inherit some of that as well. Um, yeah. All right. So um, some really good uh, thoughts, uh, and even for my own self from the way I live my life, right? Here's another great comment from Susan. Um, she's learned through their hardships, struggles, perseverance, and their importance of the family unit uh, has shaped her morals and values. Totally grateful for life's lessons. Yeah, I think that's um, uh, that's really true. Yeah, life lessons for sure. Um, okay. Do, do, do. And Roxanne says, family history has expanded my knowledge of history and given me a more personal perspective on it as well. I've also learned both sides of my family cross paths all over the place. Yeah, I think that's really true. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I shared a story about my ancestors meeting up at a basically a business conference in Cincinnati. And um, it's another one of those moments, right? Um, okay. Uh, do, do, do. So, yeah. Oh, let's share Miko's. Miko always has something meaningful and good. And of course, we talked about this over the last couple of days. Uh, the wonderful Sicilian art of Bella Figura. And I know I mispronounced that. Miko, do not make fun of me. Always look your best, do your best, give your best, and make it look effortless, despite how much effort it might take in the background or how small the situation might be. That is really insightful. Um, I'm sitting here thinking like, that's a great lesson to learn and certainly a big piece of Miko's heritage. And I'm also thinking, I see that in Miko as his colleague every single day. <laughs> and I have these constant conversations with him about um, about work and, and our contributions and our efforts at Find My Pass. And I see that in you, Miko, all the time. Wow. Um, that is very insightful to Miko's personality. Right there. Um, <laughs> um, all right. A couple of comments about my my story about keeping things and reusing brands and things. Um, you know, Susan saying we come from a generation who believed waste not want not. They didn't discard what could be used, reused. Why would they think of a what would they think of a throwaway society? I totally agree. Um, and. It's, it's just, it's really relevant, right? And today we think about environmental impact for sure. Um, and if all of us made those little efforts, right, we would be making a bigger difference. Um, 
And a couple of you saying, yep, yeah, I'm sitting here kind of smiling and nodding of so many of my saving glass jars and bits and bobs comes from my grandmother and her experience in World War II. There's always a few extra tins of food in the front side room, sideboard, front room sideboard, just in case. And yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> and extra tins in case of a zombie apocalypse. Um, I really like you. <laughs> um, you know, anyone still iron the Christmas wrapping paper for next year? We absolutely do. Um, I don't, I don't iron it. I'm just going to be honest. Um, but I do save the gift bags and reuse them. Um, absolutely. Um, William saying our postal service, Royal mail have asked for elastic bands to be put in the post boxes as they use them daily instead of being bent by everyone. That's a great idea. Um, that's fantastic. And yeah, all of these things we think of today as kind of, you know, environmental friendly and, and making small changes to making a larger impact, but it comes from a very, um, historic place, right? It comes from a place of our, our heritage and our ancestors doing this and teaching those habits. And you have to imagine, right, way farther back, they learned it from someone too, right? So how, um, you know, how far can we trace the idea of keeping a root cellar or, you know, saving rubber bands? What year were rubber bands invented and made available to the masses? And so how long have, or has our societies been teaching our children to keep their rubber bands? Um, yeah. I've never, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Maybe someone wants to Google it. Um, <laughs> and, and even now it's, it's kind of a growing movement. Um, I'm actually in a, this is totally a sidebar and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm getting totally off family history, but I'm, I found this Facebook group about a year ago. It's called buy nothing. And the whole idea is bartering amongst neighbors, right? So if I have a hundred rubber bands, I can put them up on the group and I can say, does anybody need rubber bands? And people come pick them up. Um, and I could do that back and forth. So it's, yeah, it's just that kind of thing, but that culture doesn't just start randomly all of a sudden. I think that's something that we were taught. And certainly we were, you and I were all probably influenced by our grandmothers, our great grandmothers, uh, and grandfathers, um, it, during times of trouble, like World War II, the depression. Um, and, but certainly they were taught as well. So it's, it's a long heritage. I'm getting totally off topic. All right, back to the question of the week. Um, <laughs> how else have your ancestors changed the way that you've lived today, right? There's this physical impact that we've been talking about. It's certainly more of um, a, a, an emotional and retrospective impact, right? A couple of you have mentioned, you know, recognizing that we live in a, a pretty good era, right, for human history. Um, we're pretty lucky. Uh, we have... Um, a lot of technology. We have convenience to, to food every day um, for the most part. Of course, we can't say that about all areas of the world, but a lot of us can. Um, our ancestors would have survived famine. They would have survived, um, you know, crucial periods of racism and discrimination. Um, it, even the idea of having multiple children and um, knowing, knowing that many of them are not going to survive some of them at least are not going to survive. Um, you know, what was it like to have 11 kids and have six of them die before, before they reached, you know, the age of five or the age of 10 or whatever the circumstances, um, really, really interesting thought process to kind of go down and, and be able to say, yeah, I can, I can, try to empathize with that person in my family tree who lost six children in her lifetime. Um, and, and also leads me to think about other political issues, right? Like women's suffrage, the right to vote. Um, I talk about my grandma a lot. She's significantly influential on my life. Um, and I know quite a bit actually about her. The one thing I don't know and I've never been able to find is her opinions on the ability of, you know, of having the right to vote. Now, that right would have been instated. She absolutely would have grown up with the right to vote. Um, but did she have opinions? Did her mom engage a suffrage movement? Um, I know that my great grandmother was um, a, of German heritage. She was actually born in in Russia, technically, and immigrated into Canada as part of the German from Russia movement. Um, and she was very strong. She was very opinionated about being American. That when they moved to the states. Um, when she finally moved to the States and that's where she had her children um, and her and her husband's naturalized, became citizens. Um, 
that was extremely important to her. So I wonder very much if she had any kind of um, stance against or for or against women's suffrage, right? What did being a citizen of the United States mean to her in terms of the right to vote? And I've never been able to find any anything that would indicate one way or another. I would love to do so, though. Um, just the idea of, you know, so my grandma used to tell this story that um, when she was a teenager, she asked her mom, right, my great grandma, to teach her a couple of words in German. And um, great grandma got really upset about that because we are American now and we speak English and we do not speak German anymore because we're not Germans. Now, of course, this is you know, pre, right in the middle of World War One and World War Two, so there's a lot of discrimination against Germans um, happening in North America um, at this period, and so th this was a big issue for for Great Grandma, right? Um, and we definitely, as a family, did not ever learn any of our German heritage. Like none of that was passed down. None of our German traditions were passed down through through my grandmother. Um, she didn't learn any of that from her family at all. She learned how to be American, um, in, in in their opinion, right from their viewpoint. So, how does that impact me today? Well, I I don't know my great grandma's stance on suffrage. I think I would really like to, um, but it also begs the question of what did did not get passed down, right? What about our German culture? Um, have I not ever been able to to be a part of or recognize, right? Germans, even Germans from a from Russia have kind of their own unique culture, unique recipes, traditions. Um, that's a part of it that I'm still very much learning all about uh, because no one, you know, b before I kind of put the pieces together, no one even knew we were German from Russia, right? No one knew we were a part of that movement until about 20 years ago or so. Um, so it's very much um, a, a piece of our family history that I haven't learned through family history, but even just acknowledging those holes, right, those gaps, um, I think is important. And that's that's a lesson to be learned from our ancestors as well. Um, I, there was a funny comment about rubber bands. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, great. Um, even Niall getting in on the rubber band conversation. Thanks. Who needs ancestors when you can have rubber bands? <laughs> if I had a rubber band for every ancestor in my tree, I'd be ecstatic. Nile. Um, <laughs> well, we should now have branded rubber bands. I think that's a thing that we should do. We should have find my past rubber bands. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> um, okay, let's get back to the question of the week. Beth adds to the conversation because my grandpa was on a ship that was torpedoed during World War II. Both my mom and I learned to swim. My daughters can also swim as it's seen as an essential skill. That is such a hands-on, just fabulous example, Beth, of exactly what I wanted to talk about today. That's perfect. It's, um, you know, it's a direct cause and effect, right? Your family has this importance of, of swimming, and it's it's an emphasis that's put on the skill because of your grandfather's experience. That's incredible. That's a very tangible example. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. And Janet says, in previous times, I would almost certainly be dead by now because over 40. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, I'm in my 40s and I could just as likely be dead too, right? Because the expectation would be that I would have a lot of children. Um, and childbirth was dangerous, right, for most of our ancestors. Um, Andrew says, found a couple who lost five sons called John, then two John Williams. That's sad. Um. <laughs> Miko, Miko, Miko. <laughs> I'm, I'm not even going to read it. I'm just going to put it on the screen. Let everybody chuckle for a second. Oh, boy. <laughs> and then Linda's response. This is what we do at work all day, Linda. <laughs> all day. <laughs> it's great. Um. Okay. Uh, and Victoria says for her question of the week, ancestors showed great perseverance and paid off either apprentices that became masters or experts in their trade through great tragedy of war and climactic disasters. You can rebuild your lives and find love. Don't give up. What a good message. What a great message. Um, and you know, we haven't even talked about climate disasters, right? Um, 
<laughs> um, you know, famine was a big one, obviously, um, you know, some huge influence in history of, because of famine, but, you know, the, the Dust Bowl in the American West um, hits my brain right away. Um, but also, uh, what year was it? 18 something. There was a volcano that erupted and affected the entire globe because of the smoke cloud. There's a book about it I've been meaning to read. Um, that would have been something that would have been really impactful for our ancestors to live through. What lessons can we learn from that? And how would that change our lives? Um, yeah, pretty, pretty impressive stuff, right? Pretty thought, again, thought provoking, kind of reflective kind of discussion today, but something well worth our time to spend on, I think. Now, there's one more story I wanted to share about my grandmother. Um, and something else I've learned from her because of family history. Um, that I have always thought to be uh, quite important. Um, so my grandfather had a dairy farm, not a huge one, but enough of an operation that um, he sustained the family and was able to support a family of five um, growing up in the, you know, in the 1940s and 50s in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and there were two things that I always knew about grandpa and his cows. The first was that the farm prevented him from serving in World War II. He tried to enlist and the government rejected him because his farm was too important to the war effort. And he regretted that his whole life. He always felt guilty about that. He had brothers that went overseas. Um, one of them did not return. And he always felt really guilty about not being able to act to serve in, in the military and active duty. Um, so that was that was one thing I have always known about Grandpa and his farm. The second thing was that Grandma ran the household, right? Grandpa ran the farm. Grandma ran the household. That was always the impression and the kind of the general understanding in our family, right? A very typical, stereotypical male-female role situation. What I've learned through family history, though, unfortunately, after grandma passed, um, but by going through her files and her materials, I've learned that actually that really wasn't true <laughs> at all. It seemed true. Um, and grandma always had fresh batches of cookies for me. And she was always the one who put, you know, dinner on the table and all those things. She did all the stereotypical feminine jobs. But she also was heavily involved in the management of the farm. And I didn't know that until... Um, until she, until again, after she passed and I started going through her papers, she was involved in an organization called Dairy Wives of King County, Dairy Wives of Washington. And she was one of the founding members, actually, and the first president of her chapter. And she made some really significant impact on the operation of the farm because she was essentially the PR voice for dairy farming in her area. And you think about the success of Grandpa's Cows, well, you had to sell the product in order to be successful. And grandma had a huge impact on that. And by going through her notes uh, through that organization, seeing her actually travel to Washington, D.C. for a national conference and give a lecture to a room full of dairy farmers and their wives, um, which she was one of the first women to be selected as a essentially a keynote luncheon speaker um, for this for this conference. Um, so she was flown to D.C. for this conference and she gave this big speech and it was recorded and she had radio bits. I have an album, an LP um, recording of her doing a radio show um, about her work in this Dairy Wives organization. And one of the things that I pulled from her notes and all this documentation is her inability to give up. She just was so absolutely determined to get to that end result, that goal that she was working towards, whatever it was, whether it was recruitment or getting sign up in the local store or um, getting a, another article in the paper. Or, you know, there's this fantastic series of letters with this radio host locally in Seattle um, that gave a, she, he was an agricultural reporter and he gave kind of a negative report on dairy farming and dairy products and how they were performing over the last year. And she kind of went back and forth with him on multiple letters saying, that's not true. And you need to change your report. And we're working really hard out here. And this is what we should be doing. And you should be, you should be helping the agricultural world, not, not giving this kind of false representation or what, how she, what she perceived as false presentation of, of dairy farming. Um, so 
I learned a lot about my grandmother during this research process and kind of just going through all of these notes and comments. She was really driving the sale of her products. So while I had this impression that she was very much the you know, stereotypical housekeeper. She actually was kind of this business manager and PR persona and so goal oriented um, that she just, she just grasped onto something and she just would not let go until she achieved it. And I see some of that in myself. Uh, I know that I've inherited some of those traits, um, good or bad <laughs> sometimes. Um, but it just, you know, it was really striking to me to learn those lessons again through my grandmother, who I always had this perception of, of this, you know, kind of cheerful um, farming house housekeeper, uh, a housewife and mother. She was a very stern, strict woman, um, but she was very much aligned with grandfather in his business um, and, and their objectives. And they were a team um, and her notes reflect her conversations with my grandfather. They would sit down at the table and she would actually, you know, take notes from her conversations with grandpa about how the farm was performing and which cow is doing well and which isn't. Um, and they had some really meticulous note taking that she, and she did all of that. So essentially she was the business manager for the farm and, that was an impression I never had of her before. And it was something that has absolutely changed my perspective, not only of her and how my family tradition kind of operated, but also how I might approach research of her and her family um, and their involvement in the community uh, and what she learned from her mother and her father um, and, and all of that, right? Changes my, my research perspective, but absolutely changes my perspective of my family members as well. So it was it's a fascinating process, right? It's a fascinating thing to think about how our family history has changed us, changed the way we lived. Um, I also actually picked up a couple of little shorthand notes from her. She was um, very skilled in shorthand. Um, and it's not something I ever learned officially, but I learned a couple of hers. So I use those now on a pretty regular basis when I take notes. Um, right. So a couple of pretty big themes today. Um about how our ancestors have changed our lives, how um, how we have been, how our characters and our individual personalities have been impacted um, by our ancestors. Janet even reflects, as I listen to you, I'm crocheting a blanket. I only learned to do this after I retired. I taught myself, but my grandmother was a keen knitter. Is it in my genes? Um, you know, that's, is it? Maybe. I don't know, um, but I hope your blanket turns out nice. Uh, my mom was a big crocheter, actually, and it's something I never learned to do. Um, but I don't know, maybe someday I'll teach myself. Um, yeah. Ah, there we go. Somebody did remind me of the name of the fire. Tambora in 1816, or sorry, the eruption, the year without a summer. That's exactly what I was talking about, Andrew. Thank you for that reminder. Appreciate that. Um, Heather comes in with her question of the week, taught me to see every viewpoint. The only grandparent I knew I thought was very cold, that poor woman had lost so many children and two husbands due to wars and various other nasty things that happened. I would love to have her here and give her a hug. Don't judge a book by its cover. Uh, yeah, 100%, right? We don't know the struggles we're all walking, you know, experiencing. Um, everybody's journey is a little bit different, but it, it's, it's impactful, right? And we can learn so much. Um, so much um, from our ancestors. Okay. Uh, do, do, do. Reading through the couple last comments. Uh, Andrew comments again, people often skip occupations for women in their trees. Farmer's wife is a real job. 100%. I have a much better understanding of, of that now, having gone through grandma's papers. But yeah, I, this was definitely a blind spot for me. You know, having this kind of family tradition and, and understanding that grandma was a housewife, that is a job. Um, that's, that's a, I mean, stay-at-home moms and all, all of that, that is work, lots and lots of work. Um, and I definitely learned my lesson on that. We'll never skip that ever again. Um, Oh, and Karen comments. This is a good one. I like this one, Karen. Thank you for getting me thinking about my United Empire Loyalist Ancestors, a group I am particularly fond of. Uh, they were strong-willed, hardworking group. Glad I take after them. Absolutely. That was a population of people, community of people that just did not give up, um, you know, in a lot of ways. And I could go on about loyalists. Uh, it's, it's been a particular passion topic for me for the last couple of years. Um, 
I won't. I've done other sessions on loyalists. Um, but for sure, they, I mean, imagine the the things they went through, right? I, I recently read a report of a woman who, her and her husband were loyalists. They moved to Canada. Um, they went back and forth between Scotland. They were separated for a while. They came back together. They were in the Caribbean islands. Um, and they did all of that. She had children born in like five different countries or something over the course of her life uh, because of uh, her loyalty to the crown um, and and their unwillingness to to um, be in the United States or, or the American colonies. Um, a fascinating story of just tenacity and and strength, um, but massive suffering at the same time. Um, very, very interesting perspective. All right. We just have a couple of minutes left. Um, and I think that we've had quite a conversation. Um, thank you all very much for contributing to this topic today. I hope it's been thought provoking. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, I do hope it's been thought provoking. I hope it's been um, something that you guys will all go into the weekend and think about um, and consider um, as you conduct your research this weekend, as you look into the new records on Find My Past, so you use those new free newspapers, you know, put yourself in the perspective of what am I gaining? What am I learning? How am I personally growing um, from my ancestors? Um, and then and we're just going to close with a couple last comments. Um, this one from Lori. Thank you very much, Lori, for watching and participating this morning. I'm glad that you said this. A big capital thank you from a farmer's wife living and working on the same homestead since 1863 in West Central Illinois. Same homesteads from 1863 is impressive enough. Um, I actually have a part of my family that's been doing the same thing uh, in Nebraska. And yeah, the farmer life is hard. It's hard stuff. Um, <laughs> so good for you, Lori. Um, keeping it alive and um, know that you always have a community here at Find My Past to support you uh, if you need a happy word or a helpful hand or just a fun message um, and a little, little little moral support. We'd be happy to do that. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, any last um, couple, a couple last comments from Joan and, and, and a few others, very thought provoking, just listening, giving me much to think about, about my family. Um, we've definitely all got a rabbit hole to go down. There are free newspapers now and find my past worth looking to see how much information is on Tambora and how much is on Krakatoa. That's a great way to spend your weekend. Um, I definitely hope that you find something interesting and you share it with us. Um, Lots of thank yous and a great chat. I hope it has been perspective and I hope it's been thought provoking. Um, I want to put up, let's see. I know we've got it somewhere here. Hang on. Do, do, do. Nope, none of those work. Anyway, if you find a story, um, if you have something you want to share with us, if you have something you think would make a great blog post um, or a, um, a fun you know, Twitter thread or something, share it with us. We would absolutely love to see what you guys are working on and have your contributions as part of the Find My Past uh, experience and sharing the community story. So make sure that you reach out to us. If you have something interesting, you can always reach us at support at findmypast.com. Um, in the meantime, uh, we'll be back next week with some an, another week of great content and great topics. Um, uh, we always look forward to these, and I'm just scrolling through the last <laughs> couple of comments. Um, I appreciate this one as a coffee lover. I set my alarm, so I'm fully caffeinated for Fun My Best Fridays. Love that. Um, absolutely love that. I have to be fully caffeinated for my Fun My Best Fridays, too. Um, <laughs> so have a great weekend, everybody. Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. Keep researching. Share those stories with us. Um, and... Um, and please do, by all means, reach out. Lloyd, I see your comment there before I say goodbye. A template suggestion for blog entries. Yes, absolutely. Please email us at support at findmypast.com and we will send you all the inf necessary information. Uh, have a great weekend, everybody, and we will see you next week.